we take a look at the parable of the fig tree from our gospel here this morning, it could seem at first that God is kind of rough, definitely on the strict side of things. If the owner of the orchard is supposed to represent God, he's upset that the fig tree has not produced any fruit in three years, just wants to just cut it down, that could cause many of us to be kind of a bit troubled. Because from time to time, we all struggle in producing fruit of the Holy Spirit for our Lord and for others. And so something might be thinking to ourselves is, is God going to cut me down? In a very real way, not only this parable, but also part of our first reading from Exodus provides us with a lot of hope. And hope is something so very much needed in our world today. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Donald Coggan, once wrote, of St. Paul's trio, faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love, that is true, but the most neglected is hope. But in the Bible, hope is a major theme. There's no question about that. So many people do try to love God and to have faith, but many people are living without hope. Those of us who are waiting for our little fruitless trees in our lives to start bearing fruit need messages of hope. How strong is our need for hope? A doctor by the name of Thomas Fuller back in 1732 once said, if it were not for hope, the heart would break. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must accept disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. And the former president of the Czech Republic, Vaclav Havel, once said in a speech, I cannot imagine that I should strive for something if I did not carry hope within me. I thank God for this gift. It's as big as life itself. And St. Padre Pio put it as simply as you could put it when he said, pray, hope, and don't worry. And of course, St. Faustina wrote, Jesus is our hope. That then brings us to a very interesting aspect of our parable. Who's the gardener? Who's the one who comes up to the owner of the vineyard and says, sir, leave it also for this one year and maybe some fruit will be able to go grow on it, because I'll take some good care of it to see if it can eventually bear fruit. Could that person be Jesus? Of course it could, but it could also represent us, you. Once we, of course, get filled up with hope ourselves, then we can go out and give it to others. So people of hope, following the example of our Lord Jesus, we don't give up on others, especially those who are right now not bearing any fruit. Why? because we know Jesus didn't give up on us. But notice something rather startling that the gardener says to the owner of the orchard after asking him to see if he could help the tree bear fruit. If not, if there's no fruit in, in a year, you can cut it down. The gardener will have nothing to do with destroying the tree. Jesus is not out to destroy us, but to save us, to make us very fruitful in the process. So this means that hope is not just a great virtue for Advent, when we await the coming of the Christ child. Hope is one of the great virtues of Lent. As we know, the passion, suffering, dying, and burial will come to Jesus. It will come to all of us as well. But we also know that the resurrection is also coming for our Lord, and for those who believe in him and follow him to the end. That really is the faith that we profess. This is the reason why we keep on going and the reason why we keep on hoping. But here's something else to keep in mind. If Jesus is the gardener, working for all of us, working to bring out the best in us, God the Father, the owner, this doesn't mean that Jesus is the good guy and God the Father is the bad one. Something very interesting taking place in our first reading. In the book of Exodus, the only time in the Bible in which God is asked to identify himself, he tells Moses, I am who am. That is a lot of meaning in that. On one hand, this means that God the Father is the essence of all existence. He is reality itself, the complete one who is. The statement also means that when God says that I am, he's clearly identifying himself from the pagan gods who clearly are not, are not God. But if we take a closer look at what God said to Moses, I am who am. What that phrase really says is that God is the one who will be with you. The name he gives to Moses is actually a promise of intimacy, closeness. That God the Father, certainly God the Son and the Holy Spirit, will be with us always to give us whatever it is that we need 
to be fruitful in his garden. That is a great source of hope. Here's another thing though to, to consider. This fruit tree had not produced any fruit in three years. It's one more year to produce the fruit, or it's going to be cut down. We know that there's a gardener there to work hard, so there's hope right there. But the question still has to be asked. When is hope the strongest? I've mentioned this many times in teachings and in spiritual direction. Some of you know the answer already. When is hope the strongest? When things are hopeless. That's when hope is the strongest. When things are hopeless. The world in which we live is rather hopeless right now, no doubt about it. But that means that hope can now be its strongest, its most powerful. But how can this be? When you can no longer trust anybody, no leaders, no politicians, man, everything's been taken away from you, you can't put your trust in nothing, everything you used to have and put to rely on is now taken away, you have nothing left but our Lord Jesus, he is all that remains, that's one that should hit you. Lord, you've all I've needed all along. And then, once everything's been stripped away, you can then hear with clarity the voice of our Lord. Now I can go to work on you. Now you can see my love and my power in your life. If you have nothing left but our Lord Jesus, you still have everything. That is why hope is the strongest when things are hopeless. Now, of course, Jesus never works alone. He brings with him the Holy Spirit, angels and saints, and some gardeners here, people in your life who will help bring that hope to you. But it will all be done in and through the love of the Father, the one who will be with you. So be hopeful, no matter what, no matter what you have to go through. But here is, because the Lord, he's so incredibly generous, one more source of hope that God has opened the door to. This is the great feminine balance that we all need. Because we all need to know that we're loved by a father. Well, we are. But we've all seen that blessing of a mother. So the Blessed Virgin Mary, she once proclaimed when she came as Our Lady of Guadalupe, do not be troubled or weighed down with grief. Do not fear any illness, anxiety, or pain. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and my protection? Am I not the fountain of life? Are you not in the folds of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Is there anything else that you need?